So, who is Jesus? Who is this man that we sing so many different songs about? Who is this Jesus that we say there's 10,000 reasons to praise him? Who is this Jesus that we pray to and worship? This man that grew up in Nazareth. It was a small town, not impressive. Who is he? This man who was there for 30 years, he was just a carpenter. This normal job in this normal town until he began his public ministry. Who was this man that went around the Judean countryside teaching crowds and training up 12 disciples, small group, healing diseased people? His teaching was nothing like anyone had ever heard. His teaching was different. He taught with authority, they said. They had read the prophets. They had the Old Testament. They heard, thus saith the Lord, but they never heard anyone quite like Jesus. When Jesus spoke, it was like God was speaking. But it wasn't just his teaching. His power seemed unlimited. It was obvious that he had power over sickness and death. Men who were born blind were given their sight. Men who had mangled arms from birth, they were made straight and strong again. Lazarus, who was dead for three days, was made alive by this man. Jesus gave him his life and breath back. And it didn't stop there. They saw his power over nature, and they were amazed. They saw him calm a huge storm with the word. They also saw his power over demons. They could barely understand demons, but they could see that Jesus was in charge. And all of this left them with so many questions, like the one we started with. Who is this man? Who is this man that the wind and seas obey? Who is this man who called himself the Messiah, the Christ, the chosen one of God? Who is this man that enraged the religious leaders of their day? He was really a thorn in their side. And Jesus' popularity caused them to be jealous and to feel threatened. But what caused them to get the angriest, what caused them to be super furious with him, was him claiming to have equality with, G with God and how Jesus viewed and treated their traditions. He walked all over them. He treated them like they didn't even matter. He didn't care about them. And so these religious rulers, they paid one of his disciples to betray him. And they had him beaten and mocked and executed on a Roman cross. And he was silent in front of his accusers. He died a death of embarrassment and shame. But three days later, he gloriously rose from the grave. And he appeared to his distraught disciples. He comforted them. And he told them that, he was, that, uh, that a time was coming when there would be no more tears. And that he would return for them. That he had to, to leave to prepare a place for them. He taught them those many days in his physical glorified form and he, he commissioned them to go into all the world and tell the gospel. Teach everyone. Proclaim the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And 2,000 years have passed since then. From then until now. And billions of people all over the world on every continent and every tribe and every tongue. Well, not every tongue yet. Not every tribe yet, but in so many different languages and so many different cultures have worshipped this Jesus Christ. Who is this man? Who is this man that every religion respects in some manner, but twists who he really is? Someone left a comment on one of my sermon clips on our Instagram saying, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, they also believe in Christ. How do you know who is right? 
How do you know who has the right Jesus? We know who is right by looking to God's word. This is where God has revealed himself. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so if we want to know who Jesus is, then this is where we need to look. And this is where we're looking tonight. So far, Paul has given his greeting. He's shared how he's thankful, and he's praying for this church in Colossae. And now he gets to the heart of the issue in verse 15, 15 to 20. These people have questioned Jesus' humanity and his deity. They've come in and spread false philosophy and false teaching. And instead of tearing down all these different arguments, Paul starts with the truth of who Jesus is. Paul comes with the real Jesus. Colossians 1, 15 to 20 is about the real Jesus. And this passage, it paints a beautiful picture of Jesus, so compelling that we're reminded why we put our faith in him in the first place. This passage has the power to rejuvenate faith that might have grown cold. This passage has the power to rekindle a passion for Jesus. This passage about the preeminence, the supremacy of Jesus, it looks to dethrone anyone or anything sitting in his place. And tonight we'll break this section into three sections. And the first one is that he shows us that Jesus is supreme over all eternity. Jesus is supreme over all eternity. This opening line in verse 15 describes Jesus as the image of the invisible God. Now, what does this mean? Plainly, it means that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And that seems basic, doesn't it? He's called the image of the invisible God. It uses the Greek word icon where we get the word icon. And this speaks of a copy or a representation. Paul knew that Greek philosophy crept into this church, and he knew what, philo what these philosophers were saying about icons. Does anyone, ever, does anyone remember the episode in the Gospels where the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus by asking him about taxes? Yeah, they had taxes back then. And so Jesus, he borrows a coin isn't it interesting that he had to borrow a coin? He really sympathizes with us. Who has change? No one, except for you. If he was here, he'd borrow a coin from you. But Jesus borrows a coin, and he says, whose image is on this coin? And they answer him and say, Caesar's. Back then, when you looked at a coin, you could see what Caesar looked like. They didn't have TV or Instagram. They couldn't just look him up on his profile. They had to look at coins to see what he looked like. Now, I don't know if you know this, but no one has ever seen God. He is an invisible spirit. God is spirit. Yes, he's come as an angel before, here and there in the Old Testament, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fourth guy pre-incarnate Jesus. But God doesn't have a body. He's spirit. And the truth that God is invisible is a given. It, it's given in both the Old and New Testaments. Um, 1 Timothy 1.17, Hebrews 11.27. John 1.18 says, no one, no one has ever seen God. And then it goes on to say, God, the only Son who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Jesus is literally the exegesis of God. When you look at Jesus, you see what God is like. But it's not just a representation or a manifestation. This is a perfect likeness, an exact image. The writer of Hebrews says, the Son, capital S, the Son, Jesus Christ, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Jesus is God in the flesh. 
And this doesn't mean that he was 50-50. He wasn't 50% man and 50% God. He isn't some type of Superman or demigod. He's not Hercules. He is truly God and truly man. So much so that when the disciples begged him to show them the Father, what did he say? He answered them and said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. John 14, 9. And that's why Paul will go on in verse 19 to say it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness um, to dwell in him. Jesus Christ is eternally God, the God who is invisible, made visible. And in Christ, we see his exact image. When we see Jesus, we see who God is. And so this doesn't just tell us about Jesus, this also tells us about ourselves. Because as Jesus is the image of God, this is what they talked about at Regen, we were made in the image of God, Jesus is what we were supposed to be in terms of character. We were created in his image, and we messed it up. But Jesus, he is the exact image. He lived how we were supposed to. In Colossians 2, Paul goes on to explain this in verse 8, reiterating this truth. He says, see to it, See to it, he says, that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And so G Jesus is supreme for all eternity. He has been God for eternity. And that brings us to our second point. Jesus is supreme over creation. So he is God and he is supreme over creation. As image emphasizes Christ's relationship to the Father, here where it says the firstborn over all creation, it introduces his relationship to the creation. And here he is also supreme. People say, I believe God is like this. Well, I believe God is like this. What they, under, what they need to understand is that Jesus is God, and you don't need to look anywhere else. This is how he's revealed himself. You don't need to look anywhere else. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And this phrase here, firstborn of all creation, gets people going. It gets them crazy. Um, it's so misunderstood and taken out of con context. Cults love this verse. Other relig false religions, they love this verse. What does it mean that he is the firstborn of all creation? Cults, false religions, they think that this means that he was born. In the fourth century, there was a group called the Arians, and this was their life verse. They love this. They taught a little song to kids. Um, they would say, there was a time when he was not. There was a time when he was not. They're saying he's a created being. They didn't believe that Jesus was preexistent. They said Jesus wasn't completely supreme over creation because he was a created being. He was great. He created other things, but he was the first created thing. This is similar to what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. They add multiple others to the following verses. They add, did you know that they add stuff to the Bible? They have their own version. Don't get it. <laughs> they say he is before all other things and all other things he holds together. But that's not what the text says. What does it mean that Jesus was the firstborn of all creation? Well, if you tell your cult friends to just keep reading, they would understand that this isn't about chronological birth. If you keep reading, you'll see that this is clearly about position. It's about rank. Look at verses 16 and 17. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all, unqualified all, things hold together. It's not so common now to think about rights and privileges of a firstborn, right? The 
firstborn received all the inheritance. But nowadays, we have to split it with our younger siblings. As a firstborn, I reject that. <laughs> Jesus is not a creation. He is the king of creation. He is the creator. Verse 16, for by him all things were created. He tells us he's the creator of all things. And then he moves us to show us what that is, what that all includes. It in includes everything, everything in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And this isn't just some random list. This is showing the all-encompassing sovereignty of Jesus. He is in charge of all of it. Jesus was there in Genesis 1, in the beginning. Jesus was the architect of creation by him. And then through him, the architect... Um, the architect, when he's planning out a house, he isn't and makes the house. He's not usually, well, the architect who plans the house, he's not usually the one who builds the structure. But Jesus, he wasn't just involved in planning creation. He made it. By the word of his power, let there be light. And it is all for him, for his glory and pleasure. Everything, everything in creation. Comets. Have you ever seen a comet? Jesus made it. Time. Here's something interesting. Have you ever thought about how time is a creation? Time isn't eternal. Jesus made time. Bacteria. Frogs. Turtles. Space. Pizza. Medium rare steak. The Grand Canyon. Sedona, if it exists. Tiny little creatures at the bottom of the ocean no human will ever see. Tiny little creatures no one will ever see. Why such complex design and why so much variety? I'll tell you why. Because they were made by him and through him and for him. Because in the existence of everything, we see the unequaled supremacy of Jesus Christ. We see his wisdom, we see his authority, we see his creativity, his deity, and his power. Jesus is supreme over creation because he is the creator and he is the sustainer. You all are taking breaths because Jesus sustains you. Your molecules are being held together by Jesus. Do you ever think about that? He is supreme over everything, all of creation. And then lastly, Jesus is supreme over the church. Jesus is supreme over the church. Verse 18 says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Jesus is supreme over the church because he is the head of the church. Paul uses a familiar metaphor here in calling the church a body. There's different body parts. You might be an arm. You, um, you might be a leg. But Jesus is the head. He's not just the leader. He's not just the CEO. He's not just the party leader, I guess. Why is he called the head? Well, you know, because you have one. If you didn't, you'd be in big trouble. You need your head. The head is the source of your life. Anything without a head is dead, and anything with multiple is a monster. Jesus is the one true head of the church. This world is very confused when they think of a church. They're very confused when it comes to people like us. They think that um, it's just the buildings we come together in. They think the church is just the building. This building here at, let's see if I know the address, 950 North Greenfield. Yes, sir. They think that's the church. But no, the church is the people, the believers in this supreme Christ. They could burn down every church 
in the world and the, and the church wouldn't even be touched. The church is the redeemed people. And Jesus is the head. He gives the direction through his word. He gives it its life. He gives it its energy. It goes on to say that he is the firstborn from the dead. Now, we've already talked about firstborn, and he's using the word in the same way. He's the preeminent one, most important. But this time, it's in reference to his resurrection from the dead. And maybe you're thinking, well, well, actually, what about Lazarus? What about Lazarus? Didn't he come back from the dead? He was raised before Jesus, wasn't he? But you see, Lazarus would die again, not Jesus. Lazarus would die again, but when Jesus rose, he lives forevermore. Jesus is the first to experience this. He is the first to experience resurrection in the theological sense. In the Bible, resurrection is an irreversible state. It is, it's to eternal life. When Jesus returns, all believers will be resurrected, never to die again. That kind of stinks to be Lazarus. It's like, dang, I died once, and now I got to die again? It was bad the first time. Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. Jesus made the way by going first, and we will rise with him later. Verses 19 to 20 says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This verse is incredible. A verse about his deity. Jesus is God, coupled with, with his death on the cross. No one could make up this gospel. No one could make up this story except for God. You see all the other religions and all their, I mean, they're all the same. At the base of it, they're all the same. Um, God is up there and you can work your way to please him. Um, you just got to do all this stuff and Sometimes it's really beneficial to the cult leader, but you can please God and you can get to heaven one day. That's every religion. If you really boil it down, that is every religion. You are working your way to heaven and hopefully one day, hopefully you're good enough. That is not the gospel of the Bible. That is not the good news. All those other religions, that's bad news. No one could make up this gospel. He made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. That through him we might have the righteousness of God. Jesus loves the church. We talked about it last week. I got a lot of flack about it last, last week about my illustration. But you guys got the point. Jesus loves his church, it's his bride. You can't say you love Jesus and not the church. Jesus died for the church. He is the head. He's committed to her. Shouldn't we be as well? You can't say you love Jesus and say you don't like the church. Jesus is supreme over eternity. He is supreme over creation. And he is supreme over the church. Our culture has a lot of facts about Jesus. They like the idea of Jesus. They've crafted many different Jesuses. Nobody wants Jesus to be the Jesus of the Bible. They all twist him. They don't want him to be God. Jesus, he's been on Time Magazine over and over. People know a lot of facts about Jesus, but they don't know him as God. They don't know him as supreme. Because if he is God, his demands must be taken seriously. Nobody wants Jesus to be the Jesus of the Bible because then they'll have to listen to what he says. His claims must be believed. His commands must be submitted to and you must worship him if he is God. And you must be loyal to him. 
Matthew 13, 16 to 18. I've talked about the, these verses before with you guys. Matthew 13, 16, 18 says that when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that Jesus is? When you hear that name, what comes to your mind? When you hear Jesus of Nazareth, when you hear Jesus of the Bible, what comes to your mind? Is it just a good teacher, like a lot of people say? Was he a social activist? Was he just a prophet? Was he Lucifer's brother? Michael the archangel? Is he a created being? Or do you answer like Peter? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. What should all this mean to us? What should this section, verses 15 to 20, about the supremacy of Jesus, the preeminence of Christ, what should this mean to us? Simply this, verse 18, what it says, that in everything he might have supremacy. And everything includes everything. There's no room for anyone else. We all have a throne in our heart. What's on your throne? Is it money? Is it your friends or relationships or this girl who's so cute, she's on the throne of my heart? We'll never admit to that. But what do you spend your time on? What do you spend your money on? What do you worship? If Jesus is truly supreme over everything, then there's no room for anyone else up there. There's no room for anyone else on the throne. Only Christ is preeminent. He must have first place in everything. First place in our families. First place in our friends, our professions one day, whatever you do. First place in the missions that we do here at church. First place in all the ministries. No one or nothing should be more important than Jesus in any ministry. He should be first place in our minds with our thoughts. He should be first place in our time and in our conversations and our pleasures, in eating, in our entertainment and play. And he should be first in our sports, first in what we watch, in our art, in our music, and in what we worship. Is there anything in his place in your life? What's on the throne of your heart? If it's anything other than Jesus, then you need to kill it. Kill your idols. Smash them. And put Christ on the throne. Let's pray. Lord, no, no sermon, no talk, no teaching could ever glorify your name or show off your supremacy or preeminence or glory as much as it should. No amount of songs or anything will ever truly show your worth and, and holiness and glory. Lord, it is incredible that you came to this, you came and stepped into creation as creator to, to save it, to save us, Lord, who were made in your image and messed it up and lived in sin. And Lord, you entered your creation and you lived perfectly and took our place in death um, on the cross. Lord, you took the wrath of God When we look at your supremacy and how incredible you are and then we think of you on the cross, Lord, that should be so humbling because one, you didn't have to do it. 
Lord, we love you and we praise you for that. We praise you for the gospel. We praise you that we can be saved. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here who doesn't believe that, I pray that, I pray that they would believe that tonight. Lord, you are worthy of all praise. 10,000 reasons isn't even enough. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for tuning in to our Redeemer YouTube channel. If this is helpful for you, please make sure that you like this video, smash the subscribe button, and hit that bell icon. It will help us reach more people with biblical truth. Thank you so much.